Welcome everybody to tonight's discussion with Granite State Home Educators and VLAX, which is the Virtual Learning Academy Charter School here in New Hampshire. We're very excited to have the discussion today with Julie Reese joining us from VLAX. Thank you, Julie. We're so glad you're here. Yeah, thank um, you for having me. This has been a long time in the making, really. We've we started working on this idea back in April. So we're really excited to be able to put this together for so many people. Uh, this discussion is going to be recorded and put on the Grand Estate Home Educators website and social media. So just so everybody knows. And uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and use the chat box feature there. Karen is going to be our Vanna White tonight to keep track of your questions and either make sure they get interjected into the flow of our conversation if it's something we need to expand on or to save towards the end if it's something that's on a new topic and we aren't already going to cover it in our extensive list of questions but we should have a pretty thorough conversation here. We were really careful in trying to make sure we cover a lot of ground in this short amount of time. So without a whole lot more to say, Julie, if you wanna take a moment and introduce yourself to our attendees tonight. Sure, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Julie Reese and I'm the Director of Partnerships and Adult Education at VLAX. I'm also a VLAX teacher. I teach um, Chinese one and two and I've been a VLAX teacher since 2011. I'm also a former VLAX parent. All of my children took VLAX courses at various times throughout their middle school and high school um, education. Awesome. Well, you'll be bringing a whole lot of experience and ground uh, perspectives into the discussion. So that'll be super helpful tonight. Thank you so much. So uh, I thought it would be helpful for people to understand the background of VLAX and so what it is, how is it's available, the range of classes since you guys have had so much growth in the last two years. If you can give us some basic information about VLAX to kind of set the stage. Sure. Um, so VLAX is, a, as uh, Michelle said, we're the Virtual Learning Academy Charter School. So we are a charter school in the state of New Hampshire, which means we are a, we're a nonprofit and we're a public school. We were founded in 2007. We are the only statewide public charter school in New Hampshire. We are, um, as a New Hampshire public school, we are free for all New Hampshire resident students. We have students who um, participate in our program on a part-time basis, which I think we're gonna talk a lot about tonight, <laughs> and students who participate in our programs uh, as a full-time student, which means we are their school of record. So we are, we are their local school. Um, we have courses for grades K through 12, K through five is new, fairly new. That was started in, uh, in the spring, late spring of 2020, the Department of Ed asked us if we could start an um, elementary program to help support schools around the state during the pandemic. So we started that a couple of years ago. And then six through 12, we've been doing for a long time. We also have an adult education program, which I'm the director of. And that is for students who are over the age of 21 who do not have a diploma and want a diploma. And it's also for students who have a diploma and want to do some lifelong learning. We are, um, we have a unique model in that we are self-paced and we are asynchronous with a lot of support and guidance by our teacher. Uh, teachers, I should say. There is no school year, no calendar. Students can enroll at any point in time. They can start courses at any point in time. They work at their own pace and they can finish at any point in time. So a student may want to accelerate math and take algebra one and geometry, you know, back to back within 10 months, or a student may need to take more time with geometry and take 14, 15 months to finish geometry. And both of those scenarios are um, more than okay. It's a huge, it's our philosophy. Wow, you cover a lot of ground. So it's at <laughs> no cost to, to New Hampshire students. What is, can you describe that asynchronous 
aspect, just in case folks want to understand exactly what that means. Right. So I think this is something that um, a lot of people learned these terms during the pandemic, asynchronous online versus synchronous. Synchronous would mean that you meet with your teacher with a bunch of people in Zoom and it happens at the same time. Asynchronous, which is what we do, is that the students have access to the course content and they work on the course content at their own pace. So students at VLAX, for example, in my Chinese course, they enroll in my Chinese course, I meet with them, I activate them in the course, and then they have access to the material. They start working on the material on their own. Um, and then I am available via office hours and appointment hours, and I have check-ins with them. And there's a lot of back and forth, but there's no, um, there's no course, you know, there's no, well, I shouldn't say course, there's a course, there's no, we're never with a group of students where the schedule has to be set. It's okay. On your own. Does that answer it? That makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. Uh, so the classes are not live at a preset time where everybody joins at a specific place and time and it's at it's when well, people plug schedule. in. Yep, they okay. plug in and then it's live when they need to meet with me, when they want to meet with me. I have hours that I'm available in Zoom. I tell my students, I'm just hanging out waiting for you to come and see me. Cool, very nice. It's a very nice approach. Um, so I'd like to get right to that whole distinction between the full-time and part-time, because I think that's where there is just a ton of confusion, really. What, what is full-time? What is part-time? Um, and, you know, how, do, how does somebody know that they're full-time, even if versus part-time, if they take a ton of classes, how the application required classes, all of that. So if you can walk us through that, the differences yeah, there. I am happy to do that. The, this is something that you all are not alone in, in being confused about this. <laughs> I was telling Michelle earlier that this is something that I often will be explaining to a lot of public school administrators um, who, who have this concern and wonder. So the vast majority of students at VLEX are part-time and part-time does not matter how many courses you take. What makes you a full-time student at VLAX is that you have gone through our admissions process. And this entails, um, you create the account, you enroll in courses, you complete a full-time application on our website. So it's a special place on our website. You complete the application, you send your transcripts, you attend an info session, you will meet with an admissions counselor. Um, to, and to, this is really to get a sense of your background, your student's background and to determine next steps. And then you'll have um, an admissions plan and you'll work on that admissions plan with your admissions counselor. And then you will get to a point, it's usually just a few weeks, then you'll sign a, an understanding of full-time enrollment. It's kind of like a little contract. And then you fill out the policy, the paperwork and you are a full-time student. Okay. So nobody accidentally becomes a full-time student. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that goes a long way to explaining some of it. So for a part-time student, so you were saying it doesn't matter how many classes you take. So could a part-time student still be taking five or more classes or all, they, all the core classes? Yes, that's a great question. So um, students, all students at VLAX can take six credits in a year, okay? So that's six classes during an academic year. Doesn't matter if you're part-time or you're full-time, you can take up to six classes, six credits, I should say. Okay. So, cause some of them could be half credit, which means more classes, right? Um, so yeah, if you, are, if you are a homeschooled student, you can take six credits with us and remain homeschooled. The only way you become a full-time student is to go through that admissions process. Okay. Now, are there required classes for full-time students versus part-time? Oh, yes, great question. There is, because just like any other public school, 
we have um, graduation requirements. You can see our graduation requirements at um, our website and they are similar to what the state, I mean, of course we meet all the state graduation requirements. We have some that might be a little more. Um, and one of the things that all students have to do is full-time students have to do an advisory with us every year. It's about, I think it's about a quarter credit every year. They have an advisor, they work with their advisor. So yes, everybody has a, um, there are graduation requirements and there are attendance requirements. Oh, interesting. So attendance requirements apply to full-time students only, Absolutely. not part-time. Not and part-time. Okay. So what is a attendance requirement like when it's a... So I think what you're getting at, because I, I there, so this is where it gets tricky. Um, there aren't attendance requirements for part-time students, but part-time students are expected to be working, you know, to be submitting work and or communicating with their instructor. So if a part-time student stops communicating, doesn't answer the teacher's phone calls, hasn't submitted work in a while, they can be withdrawn. So that's okay. a little bit different. That's sort of pay some progress requirements for the part-time students. The, and really, I tell schools this all the time, and I tell my students this all the time, just communicate with your teacher. That's the most important thing. Just say, I can't do any work this week because you know I'm sick or something has come up. For our full-time students, we do have requirements from the state as a public school. So we do have to submit reports and data. So we have to submit, um, our students have to be earning five credits. I believe for our full-time students, they have to be on track to earn five credits during an academic year. Okay. Now, do your full-time students take the same statewide testing that the traditional district schools give? And do part-time students have to take that? Uh, Part-time students do not. I mean, if they are enrolled in another school, they're subject to whatever is going on at their local school. Um, our full-time students, yes, we do offer all of the state-mandated testing. Okay. Uh, can you expand just slightly? We got an extra question from Karen. Is that limit of six credits at one time or six credits earned in a, in a calendar year or academic year? How, do, um, how does that go? That's a great question, Karen. It is six question, It is six credits earned over a year. The year starts July 1 and ends June 30. Okay. So if a family hypothetically started in June, they could cram in some extra stuff and then get a fresh start July yeah, to 1. That, to that six credit, yeah. 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 Okay. And it, and it is some complicated math. So I would say if, because students start at any time, if you yep. have any concerns, contact our school counseling department and they can, they can look at the numbers for you. Because if you start a class in May, you're not going to have finished the full credit. You might only yep. finish the quarter credit and then the rest okay. will go to the next year, you know? Oh, okay. So All can, right. It's a little bit mushy. All right. Well, that makes sense. Okay. That gives us some framework for understanding this, the credit limits and timeframes. That helps a lot. Um, okay. So can you now tell us about that application and enrollment process for full-time versus part-time students? Because I think there's been a lot of confusion on that as well. Okay. So um, part-time students, all you have to do is go to our website, vlax.org, click on enroll, you create an account. Um, well, you're, you create an account for your student and then your student can request a course. When your student creates that account, it will create an, a guardian account. So all they have to do is create an account, request a course, and you as the guardian can um, approve that course and they are ready to go. Okay. Does it then have an approval process or anything else at, from the VLAX administration to say, Yes, no, maybe so, or? There's no approval process. It's um, students will be assigned an instructor uh, pretty much right away, unless it happens to be a time when, you know, when a course is full and there's a wait list, but we have not, we had some issues with wait lists at the beginning of the pandemic, but we have not um, since. So okay. everybody will get in. Um, 
and the only other approval might be there are some courses that have some prerequisites at the high school, you know. Sure. But sure. That's, if you can show that somehow you've met that prerequisite, then that's fine. Okay. So if a so essentially a part-time student could pretty much start right away. Is that what I'm hearing? Does that sound right? Yeah. Yep. Pretty close. You could, I mean, you could create an account tonight after this meeting and request a course and your student could be assigned tomorrow or could be assigned an instructor, you know, in a couple of days. It's usually not okay. more than a couple of days. Okay. Then once your student is assigned, you will get an email from the instructor saying that they, you need to set up a welcome meeting. So the course is not automatically turned on. You do have to meet with the instructor first for a welcome meeting. Okay. And the parent has to approve it. Uh, and then there's this uh, teacher assignment and welcome meeting. And but it's it all happens in a matter of days. Yeah, it should happen pretty quickly. Yep. Okay, super. And for the families that are considering this as a full time enrollment, how does that compare? So for full time enrollment, you still do the same thing. Create your create your account, request a course, get started in your course. And at the same time, fill out that full-time application and get going with our full-time um, admissions team. Now, you will, if you are homeschooled, you will need to remain as a homeschooled family until you are officially accepted into the VLAX full-time program. So here's where there's been a lot of confusion over the years. If a family is moving from one school environment mm -hmm. to VLAX full time, and that's their intention. Is there a time frame where they need to uh, wait to be approved for full time? So at least at one point, the process used to entail families uh, temporarily uh, signing up as homeschoolers and filing our notification requirements while waiting for that approval process that could take I don't know, maybe successful completion of one class or can you expand? No, it doesn't take that long. It probably, okay. um, so the first part of your question is, yes, the students have to be, they've got to be somewhere. They've got to either right. be enrolled in the local school or they've got to be full-time at VLAX or they've got to be, you know, they're a homeschool. So if, a, if, a, if you're going to withdraw your student from the local school, before you are a full-time VLAX student, you will have to, you know, be listed as homeschooled. How long of a time does that typically take? It really varies, but it shouldn't take, it's usually about four weeks. And it can, and it, the reason why it varies is it does depend on um, what your student has done. So sometimes we have students who have done a lot of VLAX courses over, you know, over their, over their life. And so that can sometimes go pretty quickly. If you've never done a VLAX course before, then we do want to see you enrolled in a few of the core academic courses. And we want to see you being able to make these, um, these PACE requirements, which is really, you know, showing that you're going to meet with your teachers as required. You're going to submit the three assignments a week four consecutive weeks that you're going to do your, you know, discussion-based assessments and everybody shows up for the monthly. But so those are the kids who have never done any VLAX. That's about how long it could take. Okay. And so once the child is accepted full-time, then they still need to go back and terminate their home ed program. Yeah. Because then they're switching from being a homeschooler to a charter school student. Yes. Yes, I, okay. whatever you would do to typically um, to enroll if you were enrolling in another public school or private school. Yep. And I, should, I actually need to correct something. I said earlier that it was five credits during the academic year. It's actually five and a half credits is the attendance requirement for our full-time students. They need to show that they are on track to complete five and a half credits during the academic year. Okay, and in that enrollment process, when somebody is indicating they want to be either full-time or part-time. They need to indicate if they're a public school student, maybe doing this as a remote 
option for their school, right? Mm -hmm. Or if they're a homeschooler, do you also keep track of families that might be utilizing the Education Freedom Account program, since that's one of New Hampshire's pathways? We do not because um, as a public school, parents don't need to, um, they wouldn't use those funds with us. So I don't think we track that. Okay, so you don't ask because, so, okay. So, because families right now, there are four options in New Hampshire. We've got public school of which there's your local district and charters. Then we have private school students. We have homeschool students. And the fourth option that's as of a year ago are EFA students. Mm -hmm. So it's one of New Hampshire's pathways. So um, I'm trying to tease out if, for keeping track of student of record, how if it sounds like that doesn't get tracked through VLAX. That does not get tracked. As far as okay. I know, it doesn't get tracked. I can double check on that and then okay. and email Michelle if I'm wrong. That would be very helpful if you could. So a student taking part-time or full-time, uh, they get issued a state assigned student ID if they don't already have one. Is that right? Yes, if we have a student who does not have a, a SACID, we will request one as we will, um, we need them for our reporting. Right, that's what I would think since that's how all the public school stuff gets, gets flowed for, from one child to the next or records or documents right. of any sort. Okay, super. Uh, I wanna circle back while we're still on this topic so we got a couple of good questions that have come in. Uh, one is, um, what happens if the student does not complete the credit in that one year time frame? So um, students at VLEX, as I was saying before, it's self-paced. You have, uh, you, you keep going. Nobody gets withdrawn from the class if the one year has um, expired. You get to keep working in the course. Okay. If you are a full-time student and you're not meeting that five and a half credit requirement, your advisor would be working with you to figure out how to help you to make that five and a half credit requirement. Okay, so, but that's where the guidance counselor steps in and you have that discussion as to what's going on and- Absolutely. Okay, all yeah. right. Uh, can guardians create uh, accounts for multiple children or is it, do they have to have a separate guardian account for each child? One guardian account. And in your guardian account, you will see all of your kids there. Okay, super. And then let's see. Uh, I think we answered that one. Let's see. Is there a way when maybe we can cover this as we get into some of the course programming, but um, is there a way to see what the course covers or teaches or the resources that are used for a particular class before enrolling in it? Um, well, at our website in the learning catalog, you can see all of the topics that are covered and you can see all of the competencies. We can't give you access to the actual course. Okay. So we can't give you a preview of the course, no, but there's okay. all of the competencies and the topics are there. Okay, got it. All right. Uh, there might be, I see this question. I think yeah. there might be some sample lessons for the elementary courses okay. in our elementary section. There might be a couple, but it, it'd be very basic examples. It wouldn't be samples of every single course. Okay. All right. So if, a stu if there are questions about placement, particularly for math, uh, how would a family go about knowing which would be the appropriate placement? It, so for part-time students, I think ultimately this is going to be up to, to you all and looking at our curriculum and as home educators, probably determining where you think it's a good fit for your student. You can, of course, talk to our school counseling department, but I think we depend on what you all have been doing and what you know about your children's math education that said, once a student is in a course, we're very flexible. So once a student's in a course, if it doesn't seem the right fit, it's very easy to move them. If it's okay. not challenging enough, we can move them up to the next level. If it's too challenging, we can move them to a different course. Okay, that helps a lot too. Cause I think sometimes 
you know, if, if you're not using a standardized curriculum, it's hard to know exactly where to plug in appropriately. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see. So if somebody part enrolls for a class, but then finds that it's not the right fit for whatever reason, are they able to uh, withdraw from that credit or that class and not have that count against their six for the year? Uh, yes. I'm just going to say the caveat is if you if you make this decision at the half credit, it's going to probably count for the half credit. But if you make okay. that decision in the first few weeks, and usually okay. people do, we call the first 28 days a grace period where it's a great time to try things out. So it is not uncommon at all for kids to try a course for 28 days and say, this is not the right course for me, or this is not the right format for me, or not the right time and they withdraw, students can always come back. Um, the other piece of that is if students withdraw, they get to keep whatever competencies they've completed. So on our transcript, it won't say, you know, withdrawn or what other schools, it'll show what the student completed. So if a student, for example, I had a student in my Chinese course last year and he completed the half credit and then he started the second part and he told me that he really did not like taking Chinese. So I said, you know what? You've got five assignments left in this other competency. Let's get you through it. And so he did. So his transcript shows half credit of Chinese plus this extra competency. So even part-time part students can still get transcripts for whatever they've earned yes. through VLEX. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. We have to do that. You know, that's all okay. the students who attend um, schools throughout the state, and there are thousands of them. We have to send them transcripts. Um, it's a transfer credit at their local school. Okay. So even though part time students don't receive a state issued diploma, they can still get transcripts that show what the student has achieved during their Absolutely. time with VLEX. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we already talked about uh, the part time. Enroll, how many classes a student can take? Um, let's see. Are there required classes for your part-time students or are there classes that are closed to them and only available for full-time students? That's a great question. Nothing is required for part-time students because they all attend other schools or they're home educated. So we don't put any requirements on them at all. Um, in terms, I mean, of course, we have students come to us from local schools who are taking courses to meet requirements at their local school, but they're not our requirements. And in terms of schools that the classes that um, part time students might not have access to the, the only one I can think of is um, our advisory course that really is not we have opened it up to um, part time students but it isn't right now. It's generally only it's available for our full time students. That's where the students meet with their um, their guidance counselor and they do this advisory curriculum. OK, and that's more to keep them on pace with their graduation or their their yearly commitment for five and a half. And yeah, it includes other things like there's some um, career exploration. There mm -hmm. is, you know, some social emotional learning that happens with that. Um, so there's, a, there's more to it, uh, than just picking out courses. Yep. Uh, do these, um, do part-time students, uh, have to be deferred for full-time students to have first dibs to those classes for, cause you, uh, you cause no. there's so many, you have so many, uh, you know, there's only so much of a teacher you can spread around, you know, right, with right. all these, these students, do, do your full-time students get first dibs more or less for enrollment? Um, they don't, they okay. don't, but I will say this because they're working with their advisor, I think they do a lot of planning earlier. So they're probably enrolling in their courses. They probably enrolled in their courses last May for this year. Whereas right now we're seeing a lot of students coming back to their local brick and mortar school and saying, oh, now I want to switch and I want to take this at VLAC. So 
so no, there's no, there's no special treatment or priority. I think it's just, they're, they're more, uh, you know, they're more in the, in the know, if you will. Sure. Or sign up ahead of time. Makes mm -hmm. sense. And, and we do have, I mean, we have about 350 teachers. So um, yes. <laughs> it's a lot. And it is a lot. And our teachers, they, they'll carry a load that is similar to what you would find in a public school. Mm -hmm. So a high school teacher would have, you know, maybe about 120 students for our full-time teachers. The vast majority of our teachers are adjuncts and they will carry between 20 and say 80 students. Okay. Now as um, a public school, do full-time students have access to IEP support services? Do, do private, or I'm sorry, do part-time students have any of that additional support or could they qualify for support if they have documentation? How does that work? So that's a great question. Basically, um, as a charter school, it is the local school district, the LEA, they are responsible for providing the special education support and services. We can't modify our curriculum or our expectations, but we do review IEPs for all of our part-time students and some of the accommodations uh, listed in the IEPs and 504s are already inherent in our model, um, or they're not relevant. So things like, um, you know, preferential seating or extended time, um, all of that stuff is just natural in VLACs. Um, and then in terms of our full-time students, so for those that were the there were their school. Again, it's the local district that is responsible for providing the services. So we will, um, their school counselor, their advisor will um, collaborate with the local school on, you know, the IEP planning and, you know, the services. Okay, so that makes sense. We provide those services. That makes total sense. That's consistent with other charter schools and how that works. So makes sense. Um, so let's see, could a part-time student take some time off from VLAX and still go right back to uh, a part-time schedule without having to go through another application process? Yeah, yeah there's no real, there's no application process for the okay. part-time students. They just create an account. Okay. So you create an account, you take your course, and then it's free of charge. You finish your course, and then you can not do a course for a year or two and then come back and take another one. So okay. it's just logging in and, you know, uh, requesting another course. Okay. So it's very much that a la carte pick it and choose. Yeah. Okay. Super. What kind of student is successful with VLAX? So I'm going to say, you know, we believe that all students can be successful at VLAX. And I am a huge believer in that. Um, it just is a question of our being able to provide a lot of, you know, the support. And I think that our model lends itself to being able to support every student. Since we work one-on-one -on -one with every student, um, we really get to know our students and know what they need and to be able to provide the, the support that they need. So I'm not going to say that there is a kind of student that is successful. I, our goal is that all students be successful. Okay. Uh, would you say that's also true for the, the younger kiddos? Because K through five is developmentally so different from the middle school kids and older. Yep, that's a great question. Um, with the K through five, again, our, we are supporting each of those kids as individuals. It does require more on the part of the parents, obviously, yeah. because it, you know, having a kindergartner, they're not gonna be able to make their own schedule. At least yep. none of mine were able to make their own <laughs> schedule. So. Yeah, true, true. No, good point. Okay. Um, what are the typical challenges that students have with VLAX where you see the, the struggles? What are, where do kids have difficulties? Um, I think it is often with that, being able to plan their work, being able to manage their time. We have some new tools that we're, we have just started launching this fall to help um, students with the planning. And we've got some better 
automated pace charts and some progress trackers that are um, better, you know, better systems to help students with that. But I think that is probably, that's the biggest. And I do think sometimes students um, sometimes forget about communicating with their teachers. You know, um, they, I had a student just this afternoon I was calling, she did not show up for a meeting she was supposed to. And I called her and I said, I haven't seen any work from you in a couple of weeks and I've been emailing you. And she's like, oh, I've been thinking about emailing you, but I don't <laughs> know that she's thinking about emailing me. So, yeah. you know, I think uh, things that I think students struggle with just it's their age, it's their develop their brain development. Yeah, the common things that they would probably struggle with in a brick and mortar environment are just the same type of things just online. Yes, just in a different setting. And I do think that um, it's something I would love to have the time to really study and collect data on is I do think that we really help students prepare for life beyond high school because it's not just the course content, but it's mm -hmm. the learning to advocate for themselves, learning to plan their time, learning to, you know, prioritize all of that. Whereas sometimes in more traditional settings, they don't, that all of that is done for them. That's Oftentimes they are, for sure. <laughs> no, good point. Are there particular uh, tech requirements that students or families need in order to participate in VLEX? Um, well, of course they need a computer or a Chromebook or some kind of device. Uh, it has to have a microphone um, and a camera. A lot of times our students will use headsets and they need to have access to the internet. Okay, but a Chromebook typically is quite adequate. They don't need something super tricked out and fancy? No, no, not at all, not at all. And there are kids who do work on their phones too. Wow. Yeah. They probably have I better. Do it, but I yeah. couldn't do it. Too, too small for me. It okay. is too small for me too. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that is the all the questions that I had prepared for tonight. Karen, are there any others? I don't see any more popping in, but this is our time for Q and A for our attendees here. So, if there are some additional questions, let's grab them now, folks. I want to make sure you've had a chance to put your questions forward. Is there anything that we didn't think to ask you, Julie, that uh, you think is important for families to know about VLEX? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's really great. And it's a good, I think it's a good thing to just, like I said before, it teaches a lot of skills beyond just the course content. Okay, we did get a good question here. It says, um, Let's see, if you get approved for an EFA, can you take classes part-time with VLEX? Uh, yes, I would think so. That's the Education Freedom Account. Right. I, yes, I, I don't see why not. All, all students in New Hampshire can take courses at VLEX. Doesn't, you know, all New Hampshire resident students can take courses for free at VLEX. Okay, have super. Who attend boarding schools who are, and private schools and public schools, all of them can take a course. Uh, another question is how often does a part-time student meet with a teacher? Uh, so this, it varies. At the minimum, they must meet once a month, but they can meet several times, a, you know, a few times a week if they want to. The teachers have office hours where, like I said, they're just, it's posted on their course page waiting for kids to come. And I'll tell you, they Kids don't come to mind. I wish they would. There's only one who shows up pretty <laughs> regularly. Um, so it gets a little lonely. And then there's appointment hours. And our teachers are required. Both of those hours, um, the number of hours teachers have are based on the number of students they have. So I only have 20 students. I'm required to have, you know, probably 10 hours a week at those times. And a teacher that has 120 students probably has 30 hours available. So a lot of it really is up to the students, how much the student wants to meet with the teacher. Okay, somebody has a question about uh, how does a homeschool student enroll? Uh, and they wondered if it was different from part-time because they were trying and see, it says they could not find the homeschool enrollment on the website. Uh, so they're, they're, 
So how would they do that? So Um, if your children already have accounts, oh, so your children have accounts and it has a different school of record linked. If that's the case, email us and we'll change it from whatever school is in there to homeschool. They don't need to change, um, or you should be able to, once you're logged in, you could probably change the the school, we call it the affiliation or the organization. If you can't, just email us and we'll change it for you, but it's the same. Um, It's just when you create that account, we have to have you say where you go to, where your child goes to school or if they're homeschooled. And part of the reason, there's many reasons, uh, we need it for data for the Department of Ed every year, but also local schools can get access to our student information system so they can monitor their students. So if you live in Dover and your children go to Dover High School, the guidance counselors there can can go in and and see information on the students who are taking VLAX courses. Right, that makes sense because I presume a lot of public schools are still utilizing VLAX as a remote option because I know that was certainly a big thing the last two years and I figure for some families that may continue. Yes, and it and it we always have been. We've traditionally always um, supported if they need if students need competency or credit recovery, or they need students want to accelerate, or we offer something that they don't offer. Um, the public schools have definitely uh, made great use of our um, services over the years. Yep. Perfect. And we have another question that says, uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, regarding part-time students utilizing the teacher, absolutely. Everybody's yep. the same. Once you're, frankly, like when you're a teacher and you have your students on your roster, you don't think of whether they're part-time or full-time. Everybody's the same. The only difference for the full-time students is that they have an advisor and their subject with who they meet with at least once a month. That's their guidance counselor. And yep. they have to, you know, meet certain requirements of ours. All right. Somebody has another specific question. It says, if the student took grammar or an English class, uh, did his assignments on schedule, would he meet only as needed or as he had questions? Or would he have to also have these routine meetings with the teacher regardless of that? Is like, is there a minimum amount they'd have to have meet minimum. with the teacher? Yep, and I should actually say that elementary students, students in grades K through five, um, if you are enrolled in all of the core courses, so if you have an elementary student enrolled in language arts, math, social studies, and science, uh, we do like you to meet, the teacher has a weekly meeting um, and that Mm -hmm. we would really like everybody to attend the weekly meeting. Um, If you are beyond grades six through 12, the minimum required meetings are the monthly check-in meeting and the discussion-based assessment, which is at the end of every module, basically at the end of every competency, it's, it's an oral assessment. Is that done as a group or individually? Always individually. Individually. Okay. Okay. The monthly meeting is done individually. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. So what else would you like families to know about VLAX that we haven't talked about so far? Um, I guess it it might be interesting for you to know all of the different um, learning pathways that we have and the courses. We have over 350 courses in our learning catalog. So we offer a lot of foreign language. We offer a lot of AP courses. We have a lot, a lot of career exploration courses too. That's an area Mm. that we've been really trying to focus on is um, career exploration and helping kids uh, even get some skills uh, while they're in high school. We have um, internship courses. We have, um, we have a project based learning pathway that starts in middle school. So some of our courses, math, science, English, whatnot, if you look in the learning catalog, projects are an option. So the course version is very, it's kind of traditional in that there's course content, there's your homework, there's quizzes, Mm -hmm. there's tests, projects are totally different. It is 
it's the same competencies, but students work um, through a pre-designed project and there's no exam or test. There's a project and a discussion-based assessment. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, and then we also have our experiences pathway, which is um, similar to, well, it's experiential learning and it's the same type of thing. So you can have your biology competencies, but instead of doing it as projects or doing it as a course, you'll meet with a teacher and you'll design how you're going to do your learning and demonstrate your mastery of those competencies. And you will have to work with some kind of outside expert. Um, it could be somebody you know, or it could be somebody that we can help you find, uh, but someone who's there to enhance your learning experience, enrich it. So how would a uh, high school lab science happen? That is a great question. We are asked this all the time. So first <laughs> I just wanna say that we are NCAA approved. All of our classes are NCAA lab approved for labs. Um, our students have, uh, you know, they apply for all kinds of colleges all over the place and we've right. never had anybody question it. The labs are done through simulation basically oh, okay. pretty high tech simulation stuff. I understand that in the chemistry course, there might be some things you do with basic um, products that you might have in the house. You know, I don't know. I don't know the details of it, but I just know that that might, that, that, is, a piece, that is a component as well, but mostly it's through simulation. I think. Okay. So no frogs will be harmed in the no biology class. Are, no, thank goodness. Huh? <laughs> Yes, th just thinking about that just brings formaldehyde right back to mind. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Uh, I think that pretty much wraps up all the extra questions that we've had, unless you have any extra, extra closing thoughts to share with us. I don't. I just want to thank you guys for uh, being here, for asking your questions. And I also want to say, just don't be shy call us, email, ask your questions. We're always happy to, um, to work with you and help figure out what might be a good fit for your student. Well, thank you so much, Julie. If you could uh, say what your email is, so if people have follow-up questions, they can email you, or if it's not something you know, you can forward that on to the appropriate person. All right, great. I actually just put it in the chat. It's jreese at vlax.org. Wonderful. Thank and you. If, yeah, I was going to say, and I just want to reiterate what Michelle said. If I don't know the answer, which is highly likely, I will forward <laughs> to the person who does. That's only fair. Thank you for your time tonight, Julie. So thank you, everybody. Oh, okay. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate that. Uh, you'll find this uh, in a few days on the Grand Estate Home Educators website, which is spelled out grandestatehomeeducators.org and on our various social media platforms uh, and our YouTube channel. So thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, Julie, thank you so much. I think this has been so, so helpful. And I, I know uh, people will be tuning in to watch a recording of this for many, many, uh, many weeks to come. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.